But I'll zoom back out, look at the whole thing again, and in particular also think about the flow of nutrients, energy, and elements into, through, and then out of food webs. So this is the realm of ecosystem ecology, where you consider not just the set of organisms and how things move around among them, but how they move from abiotic, out of abiotic components into the system, and then out of the system back into the abiotic components. So bottom-up control of food webs occurs when abiotic factors, such as the amount of nutrients, sunlight, or water, are going to determine the abundance of primary producers, which will then have a series of cascading effects on the things that eat primary producers, on the things that eat the things that eat primary producers, and on the decomposers of all of those organisms. Now, in the introductory video, I talked really about nitrogen and nitrogen limitation. And I brought it to your attention via carnivorous plants, but also via these little tiny patches of flushing growth where animals, including humans, are peeing and putting nitrogen inputs into the soil. When that happens, you see a flush of growth, which suggests that these systems are nitrogen limited. And you might have bottom-up control on the food web based on nitrogen limitation. Now, generally, different nutrients can limit primary productivity in different places or contexts or organisms. In the upper right, you have predictions about the things that are limiting various forms of production in the ocean, such as diatoms or uh, phytoplankton. And you can see in different places in the globe, things like iron might be limiting or things like silica or nitrates might limit them. And then in the lower left, you have a global map of the predictions of nitrogen limitation of plant growth, terrestrial plant, plant growth, or phosphorus limitation of terrestrial plant growth. If you look at that lower figure, you see that in the place where my cabin is, it suggests nitrogen limitation. Indeed, in temperate terrestrial environments, nitrogen is often the limiting factor that's determining how much plant growth you have, and therefore how many consumers you have, and the decomposition thereafter. Now, this might seem initially crazy because there's a hell of a lot of nitrogen out there. It shouldn't seem like it shouldn't be limiting. For instance, the air you breathe is about 78% nitrogen, give or take. But the reason why you can solve nitrogen limitation is that this nitrogen that you're breathing is in a form, N2, that is, that is unavailable to metabolic processes of most organisms. Now, the way nitrogen can be changed into something that is usable by other organisms is basically by what's called nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Now, what happens here is that the, this uh, atmospheric nitrogen, N2, can be fixed into these more usable forms by bacteria that are in the soil or the root nodules of legume plants. Like, Heather, what's a legume? So I just consulted with my wife who teaches in Sejep right upstairs, and she tells me that legumes are things like peas and beans and alfalfa uh, and a variety of other things of that nature. This nitrogen fixing that's occurring in root nodules or in soil bacteria does fix a ton of nitrogen, but it's still not enough to um, allow plants to grow at their maximum in many environments. In British Columbia, in northern British Columbia, there is, does indeed seem to be a lot of studies trying to understand what's the limiting forest growth, because there they want to cut down the trees and turn them into wood, wood for houses and whatever else. So what they've done is a series of fertilization experiments. As stands get bigger, they have a total, total higher amount of productivity, tree stands. But if you can see in the colors, you have situations where they're also fertilizing them with nitrogen. And in those cases, given a particular stand age, you have a higher productivity. So indeed, nitrogen uh, fertilization research has confirmed that nitrogen deficiencies are widespread in BC forests and that nitrogen additions have a substantial positive effect on tree stand and growth. So how do they add nitrogen? Well, basically they add P, urea, although it's synthetic urea. So urea is currently the only fertilizer widely applied in BC uh, for a number of reasons, good history of use, um, easy storage, etc. So basically, they're spraying synthetic pea over the forests so that you have a, a system-wide increase in primary productivity and in particular tree growth. Fertilization of this sort, including nitrogen, is increasingly common uh, globally. And in this system here, it seems like many of the components uh, are 
bottom up controlled because of nitrogen limitation. But in other food webs or in other components of this food web, you can have other controls on the flow of nutrients and energy through the system and therefore the entire food web structure. For example, you can have top down control of food webs. Now this particularly occurs when predators control the abundance or the productivity of some of the lower trophic levels. So for example, if wolves in the system eat or scare so many moose that they don't browse as much, then that might influence the, avail the, the size of riparian trees, which might have a whole series of other cascading influences. So you remember with bottom-up control, you could add fertilizer and see what happens. So wolves used to be present throughout North America in different subspecies you see on the left there. Then on the right, you can see that they disappeared from most of the southern uh, North America. So in the Yellowstone ecosystem of North America, wolves were hunted to extinction in the early 1900s, but then they were reintroduced in 1995. So let's go to Yellowstone. And in fact, I was able to do so a couple of years ago for the first time and take a look at the ecosystem. And then we can look at some of the studies where people have looked at the effects of adding wolves into the system and whether that's controlling the entire food web. So a lot of people go to Yellowstone specifically to see the wolves since they're so rare throughout the rest of the lower 48 states of, of the US. However, for me, the most exciting thing was the bison, which were everywhere um, because I hadn't seen a lot of them, although they are present in Northern Alberta and uh, the Yukon. And here's a, here's a fun um, bison traffic jam that you always get stuck in when you're driving through in Yellowstone. Now, I did see some wolves when I was there, but only at a very great distance, and you could just sort of see them moving around with a very high-powered uh, lens or with spotting scopes or things like that. So wolves were added to the, back into the Yellowstone ecosystem in 1995. And then you have a series of studies looking at how the ecosystem has changed since that time point, with pictures on the left and some data in the middle there. So as you can see, the population of wolves started low and then increased and stabilized. Simultaneously, the populations of things they would eat, like elk, declined. The degree of browsing that elk had on willows, for example, along the stream beds, that went down dramatically as well. And the height of the riparian vegetation went up. Then you have a whole bunch of other cascading influences from that, such as the cottonwoods and willows went up around the, uh, around the creeks. The numbers of beavers increased. Beavers were also reintroduced into the system. So here's a new food web where the wolves used to be absent from, from this. Uh, and then you added wolves and the wolves are foraging on a number of different things and influencing them through this fear of predation, which then has a big influence on a lot of the different plants, the things that eat the plants, and indeed even more removed ecosystem components such as birds. A whole series of cascading top-down effects. So wolves and other organisms like starfish, where this was first studied, uh, and sea otters, beavers, and elephants are called keystone species because they have disproportionately large effects on the natural environment relative to their abundance. That is, even though there aren't that many of them, they have a huge effect. And we'll discuss um, uh, keystone species a little bit more in a subsequent lecture. But here let's also think about now population ecology and zoom back in on two different components of this food web from our cabin here. And those two components are lynx and pink salmon, both of which I discussed. And I want to ask, why do some animals such as these show population cycles? This is a classic, important question in population ecology that population ecologists have struggled with for decades. Let's talk about pink salmon first. So this year, there were tons of pink salmon in my cabin. And here's a uh, sequence of the drone passing over all the pink salmon. There were probably 500 pink salmon right in that area in front of me. So very high abundance of pink salmon uh, in the stream this year. But if you looked last year, there were none, no pink salmon whatsoever. But the year before that, they were super abundant again. But the year before that, there were none. But the year, so there's a two year cycle. Every second year, they're really abundant. Now, Here's a set of data for that from a series of different streams in Washington, Oregon, and California, where you have three different species of salmon. Indeed, those three that I showed pictures of earlier that the bears would eat. And you can see that the pink salmon show this dramatic cycle of fluctuations, where every second year they're really abundant. 
And the reason is, is that's because of their life history. That is, their particular life cycle, which is a strict two-year life cycle. That is, they're hatched, they live two years, and they lay their eggs, and then they die. Then those grow up, after two years they spawn, and two years they'll spawn, etc. So you have these alternating generations that are called lineages, or odd year runs of salmon, pink salmon, and even year runs. So you can see that cycling here. So you can have essentially completely different lineages present in the stream in even years, 2018, 2020, 2022, and odd years, 2019, 2021, 2023. So that one's fairly easy to explain, why pink salmon cycle. But why do lynx cycle? So lynx cycle on almost a 10 year regime. And so here you can see in the blue, the lynx population density cycling in the Yukon. Now, one of the things that has intrigued people about this is that it seems to match with a delay the cycle in snowshoe hares, like rabbits. So you can see the brown is a snowshoe hare cycle. And so the linkage between these two sets of cycles has led to a number of hypotheses for why you get population cycles. So one hypothesis is that it's just the predation. So the snowshoe hare population increases, as a result, the lynx do well and their population increases, and then they eat all the snowshoe, snowshoe hares or scare them to death, and basically the snowshoe hare pop population plummets, and then that means that the lynx population doesn't have enough food and then it plummets, which then means that the snowshoe hare population can increase again, which means that the lynx population can increase again. So predation is thought to potentially drive these cycles. But another one might be competition within that species, the snowshoe hares. That is, when they're not very abundant, there's a lot of food for everybody. There's no um, food limitation. So they have lots of kids, and those kids all survive, and they increase dramatically. But then when the population cycle is at the high end, all of a sudden you have too many snowshoe hares for the food resources. They start to die, they don't reproduce well, their, um, their babies don't survive, and so they plummet. Meanwhile, the lynx are just passively following the abundance of the hares. So in the one case, the lynx are the drivers of the system. In the other case, they're just the followers of the system. So there was an experiment that they tried to determine the drivers of these cycles, where they built big explosions in the Yukon Territory, in Kluwani National Park. And there's a picture of one of the enclosures uh, in, in there. Now, they did different things in these different enclosures. First, they had several where they're just not manipulated, they're left alone, things can go in and out of them, and they haven't done anything else to them. There's controls, like experimental controls. Then in one plot, they put an electrified fence around it so the lynx couldn't get in, but otherwise they didn't do anything else. Then in two other plots, they added extra food for the hares. So the lynx could go in and out of those, but the hares had lots of extra food. And then the final one, they put an electric fence to keep the lynx out, and they added food. So here are the results over many different years um, for the different treatments in relation to the control treatment. So in the lynx plot, you can see that uh, an increase over the bar means that there's more lynx, there are more hares than in the control plots. And you can see that, yeah, there's a bit of an increase in the, in the hare population when the lynx are excluded. If you allow them to have, if you give them extra food, but don't keep the lynx out, you see an increase in the hare population, but it's not super dramatic. But in the one plot where you kept the lynx out and you added extra food, you see a dramatic increase in the abundance of hares in relation to the control plots where you did nothing. Which suggests that it's not predators that are driving the cycles, it's not food limitation that's driving the cycles, rather it's the combination of the two that are driving the cycles. Okay, so this lecture has been about ecological complexity and some of the flavors of ecology that are used to study that complexity and to try to understand it, including behavioral ecology, population ecology, community ecology, and ecosystem ecology. There are other forms of uh, ecology as well, other flavors of ecology, including evolutionary ecology that we'll discuss in the next couple of lectures. Now, these different ways of studying ecology, of course, are all ways to attempt to understand uh, interactions between organisms and their environment. 
including the other organisms in that environment. And I attempted to illustrate that via a bunch of the interactions that I'd been able to record and discuss and observe at my cabin in British Columbia. And we'll get to some more of them in subsequent lectures. As the bigger picture being, you have this massive ecological complexity, uh, so beautifully captured by this quote at the end of The Origin of Species. And to set up the next lecture, I want to say what happened at the end of this quote. There is a grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed by the Creator into few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet has gone on circling according to the fixed laws of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. So in the next lecture, we're going to take this ecological complexity and try and understand how it evolves.